Shut your eyes. Stop your ears. Remain unaware. Curl up. Close down. Return to fetal security. Fold in on yourself. Deny the outside world and cling to blissful oblivion. A blanket of blank isolation. Unthinking peace that you will relinquish only when you are dragged, screaming, into awareness at the unseen hour. We all have to start somewhere, and all things have their beginnings. Those early moments are a fragile, tender time, apt to suffer damage. Small ripples that, in time, develop into tidal waves. Trauma of the kind that will not heal without treatment. Treatment that can be obtained in the offices of a wise but unpredictable psychotherapist. One who, even now, clicks on his dictaphone. me, hello, Dr. Lawrence Sebastian Fawkes, therapist of the strange and unusual, rejecting normal, boring psychotherapy in favor of conducting group therapy sessions with artificially generated life forms, or subtypicals, as we call them, and their creators, sometimes as robots, sometimes genetically altered wildlife, sometimes puppets who have magically come to life. Our therapizers are more reframing their miraculous existence into mundane interpersonal drudgery and brings them into a healthy relationship between the creator and the twisted offense against nature, what they have gone and done and brought into the world. <laughs> a little bit about me there, in case you was wondering. Okay, starting recording here. Session one, two individuals, a mad scientist and her creation. Now, Mr. Strideforth. You are a Frankenstein, correct? Uh, Frankenstein's monster, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I said, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> and Dr. Perch, you sewed them together from a bunch of dead bodies. That's right, yes. I took only the finest specimens, the largest shoulders, the best and most elevated human material, and artfully constructed this magnificent monster you see before. You see, she just casually comes out and calls me a monster. You're always doing that. Oh, come well, on. Well, Dr. Perch, we... We, we do prefer the term subtypical. Do we? I'm not... <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Strideforth is clearly a very well-constructed and enormous subtypical, and yet there is some conflict between the two of you. I mean, he's completely unreasonable. He's selfish, he's arrogant, he has no regard for the feelings of others. He was supposed to be a perfect refinement of all that is good in humanity, but he's turned into just a stupid coward that keeps blundering around, causing mayhem and destroying things. I'm right here! <laughs> It's been like this since the very beginning. What, what, what do you think that's going to do to my self-confidence? How's, how's that going to affect a child's development? Oh, for goodness sake, you are not a child. You never were. You were brought to life fully formed with all the advantages it is possible to have. You're incredibly privileged. There is no justification for this self-pity. I suppose I should just be happy that my creator rejected me before I'd drawn my first breath. It's called postpartum depression, if you had any compassion at all. OK, this, this is good. We're, we're commuted, communicating. <laughs> Lots of feelings. Uh, where do you think it all started? It all began when she brought me to life. <laughs> oh, yes, he was so perfect when he was just a lifeless collage of hand-selected cadavers on a slab. Oh, but surely you don't remember your own creation, Rufus. On the contrary. Not only do I remember it, but I have a recording of it. Look, she stapled a tape recorder into my chest cavity here. <laughs> Medical Journal of Dr. Perch. Third attempt at reanimation of human tissue through process of overclocking of organic enzymes, electrolysis and osmosis for origination of outfolding. Ooey ooey ooey. <laughs> Subject is in optimal condition. Outrageously fresh. So beautiful. So beautiful. Featherstone, begin the transfer of fluids. What you are? Pouring in the juices now. Begin palpitation of the circulatory system. On it. Intubate and begin ventilation. Gotcha! Pump in the bellows! 
Spool up the generators. I'm already doing free things. Must I run this entire enterprise on my own? Now, now, I can probably manage. Good. Good, it's working. It's working. More featherstone. More power. version of a thing you made before. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's horrific. No, we must destroy it immediately. Ah! You're upsetting him. He's going to break out of his restraints. Ah! Kill it, burn it, tear it to pieces. It's getting away. Ah! You see, she was literally trying to kill me. I forgot about that bit. Well, congratulations on playing a recording of something we had already described. You have wasted a very expensive therapy session, Rufus. Well, now, before you decide what a waste of time feels like, I'd like us to try an exercise. <laughs> if you would both lie back, slow your breathing, and chew on this monologue. What's that? Who's there? You come out where I can see you. Oh, it's you, Simeon. What do you mean giving old Joe a scare like that? <laughs> that was my dog. That's right, I've got a dog called Simeon. <laughs> Don't know why. The, the name, I mean, not, not the dog. I know why I've got a dog. I want him on a tombola. Well, I say one. Uh, anyway, uh, I take him with me everywhere. Yes. Good to have a companion on nights like this. What time is it? 4am. Just a couple more hours and the shift will be over. Thank goodness. I don't normally do the night shift, but Steve was sick. What can you do? But as I say, I don't normally do this. Don't like it. The quiet. The dark. The quiet dark. Never used to bother me. Ah, I know what you're thinking. Silly old fool, scared of the dark like a little kid then you haven't seen what I've seen. It was years ago. It's etched in my memory like a broken etch -a sketch that won't quite wipe clean. I was a young man at the time, fresh out of college. The summer, I, I scoured the paper for jobs. You know, there was the usual London fair, shop assistant, paper boy, uh, Lord Mayor's private barista. <laughs> but I wanted something different, somewhere different. And then one day I saw it. In the classifieds, Knight Porter wanted. The words jumped off the page as if they were shouting at me, perhaps because they were all capitalised. A Knight Porter in a private maternity hospital in Whitby. I'd never heard of anywhere so exotic sounding and I knew I had to go. So I applied and I got the job. Told my parents, my friends, that I was moving to the north. Birmingham, they said. Further, I said. <laughs> I arrived in Whitby one week later and made my way to the pub where I'd rented a room, the Whippet and Shovel, it was. That afternoon, I was chatting to the landlady and some locals. Ah, what had brought me here, they asked. I mentioned my new employment. Their faces fell. They told me, begged me, not to accept the post. There were funny goings on in that hospital, they said. It was haunted, they said. It's run by nuns, they said. <laughs> Real ones. <laughs> I dismissed it all, of course. Northerners, who, as we know, are all the same. They're superstitious <laughs> folk. And in any event, I'd read my horoscope and it said, good luck and fortune would be mine. That night, I made my way up to the hospital. I say hospital. 
didn't look much like a hospital to me. But then again, they do things differently in the north. So perhaps the uh, isolated cliff top location and barbed wire was routine up here. On my arrival, I was met by a nun, the Sister Mary Pious Extreme. She'd taken a vow of silence, but uh, she managed to run me through my duties through the international language of charades. My hours were 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. I was to aid the nuns in their running of the place, you know, fetching and carrying mostly, uh, but also moving mothers and babies between wards. And uh, another task that had two syllables that I couldn't quite make out. Finally, under no circumstances, was I to enter the room at the end of the corridor. I began my duties in earnest. Yet to start with, things were busy. Uh, I assisted the nuns and nurses as they dashed between the different rooms and wards, tending to the patients. But, uh, I noticed, no one, not one person, entered the room at the end of the corridor. By 1am, everything had gone quiet. Everyone had fallen asleep. Silence filled the place. And suddenly I heard the soft rattling of metal. I knew immediately where it was coming from. The more I tried to ignore it, the louder it became. And then I heard it, softly at first, but then louder and louder. Help me. Help me. It's a child's cry. I walked towards the room, my mind recalling Sister Mary Pius Extreme's miming of the consequences of entering <laughs> the forbidden room. She'd used her hands frantically to make a slashing motion at her throat, as if with a knife. She'd collapsed to the floor and writhed around, <laughs> and she'd enacted something that sounds like bell choir. That was unclear. Had her terrifying animated demeanour been a reflection of what truly lay behind the door? Or was it a scathing indictment of my own charades playing inadequacies? I mean, who knows? <laughs> help me. Help me. The voice called again. My curiosity got the better of me. I, I tried the handle. And to my surprise, the door opened. Inside, I saw a child's nursery. At the center, a cot. Well, no, not a cot, a cage. And in it, a child, a little girl. White blonde hair and a cherub's face. Tears in her big blue eyes. My heart softened. At the foot of the cot cage, a note read, name, Dora. Mother, unknown, deceased. Father, Santa. <laughs> the child pointed to the padlock on the outside of the cage with her chubby fingers. It was locked with a number combination. And the child gestured to me the code. Six, six, <laughs> six. I made a mental note to speak to the nuns about password security and opened the lock. <laughs> As soon as I did, I realised my mistake. The angelic features contorted into a malevolent grin. The eyes flashed red, my head swam, and my body fell to the ground. I was pretty sure I'd misread who the father was. <laughs> when I came to, I found myself in Whitby Infirmary, and the doctors there told me there'd been a fire at the maternity hospital, and it was a wonder that I was alive. In the bed opposite, a man was reading a newspaper which bore the headline, 37 nuns burn alive as fire captain unable to decipher the charade solution for help. Thank you. Right, that gave me a bit of a breather anyway. Where are we? Oh, yeah, uh, Strideforth had escaped yelling into the night. That's right. I wandered for days, naked as the days the various parts of my body were separately born. 
Alone, unable to speak. Well, you know who we should feel sorry for. That poor old couple, the first people you encountered. How do you know about that? Uh, your recordings sync automatically with the lab's Wi-Fi. I've heard them all. Well, that... that's an invasion of privacy. It's your... it's your home. I, I hate you! Don't play that tape! I'm playing the tape. No! Oh! 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 What's that? Oh, look! It's a giant naked baby man botched together from enormous lumps of mildly necrotic flesh crying alone in woods. What's the world coming to? Poor thing must be lost. Hello there. Oh, look. Oh, he's, he's seen his own reflection in the pond. Oh, he must be he must be having his mirror stage, the little, this little sexy naked baby. <laughs> He's friendly. He's coming over to me. <laughs> Look how he's, he's gently caressing my head. What an adorable... No! Oh, Flem. Oh, you, you turned his head backwards. No, no. Oh. Now, I know you didn't do it on purpose, you little cuddly little ball of... <laughs> ..body parts. You, you poor brute, come here. I'll take you home. I'll, I'll take care of you. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, so you see, he's a murderer. But, but, but after, after what I'd been through, I, I, was, I was lost and confused. Now, let's not blame our mistakes on the circumstances. Even un in unpleasant and traumatic conditions, you have the ability to make choices and you have to take responsibility for them. Let's not forget we are reframing your wild melodramatic story in relatable bore in human terms. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what we all signed up for. But having said that, I am on tenterhooks. Uh, what happened after you left the mutilated corpses of your victims? Mm, yes, well, after that tragic accident, I managed to steal a, a sturdy set of tweeds from a washing line. Which... By the way, I do not count as a transgression, since the owner had totally ruined them by putting them through a wet wash. And... <laughs> anyway, my wanderings brought me to the outbuildings of a farmhouse, where I learned to speak English from an old discarded novel. Oh, what novel was that? Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> so that's where he gets it. And I observed the people living there. Creepy. Why must you criticize every little detail? It was a difficult time. Oh, just play the tape. I will. I will. Maybe you can pick up a few tips on, on how decent, caring humans behave. Gabriella and Elmo were kind to me once I made my presence known. They, they took me in and cared for me. Really good, yeah, Rufus. Uh, you've, uh, you've written your own name, such a clever boy. We're so proud of you. So proud of the progress you've made. And we can't tell you how much it means to have you here uh, with us so tragically childless ourselves. To see you lear listen, learning play clatch. <laughs> Let's try that one again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, I'm seeing you are learning to play catch, uh, riding a bicycle, uh, to single-handedly plow our 33-acre farm. <laughs> oh, oh, Gabriella, I'm, I'm so happy here. I don't know what I would have done without you, clatching here and clatching there, what I would have become after such a rocky start in life. Rufus, uh, it's that that we want to talk to you about. You see, uh, now that you have these basic life skills... And now that all the hard labor in the farm is done... Yeah, uh, we feel that the best thing for you would be to return to your creator. But she's so emotionally withdrawn! Uh, we know that it won't be easy, but both of you deserve the chance to get to know each other. To reconcile. Perhaps you could uh, seek out some specialized therapy aimed at mad scientists and their creations. Well, that does sound like a strong and engaging narrative concept. All right, I'll do it. Off I go. Stride forth. Off to meet his maker. Oh, and uh, stride forth. Uh, take this with you to remember us by. What is it? Why, it's hearty folk noodle explosion, Bear Park. <laughs>
There I am, a grin, a posture, and a lie. Something sparkles in the corner of my eye. And then it all goes quiet, someone hits the light. And honey, there you are. Do you know what to see me? Does this happen all the time? Do I take a number ticket and stand in line? God, you must collect these songs like a flower collects a light. Well, here's one more. I can't describe what it is sets you apart. Spins me. Drops me like a boxer, reeling at the knots, yeah. Conscious of the loss until the next day, waking up the world's a different place. A sense of colors back, my courage and my grace. And a sense in a day that's spent without you is a waste, waste and a shame. I never saw you coming, no, I never felt a thing. This is the last place that I ever thought I'd find you in. It wasn't my idea, it's you. You never should have been so beautiful. Was it something, some kind of gremlin on the line? Is it the way you caught the light? Your natural aptitude for flight Cause I am failing I have failed to shake you off To reassert the even kill That I had before you made me feel There's something That I can't describe Sets you apart Spins round Drops out like a missile, volatile and fissile. Cased in all this metal, there is something that I can't describe. Sets you apart, spins me, drops me like a boxer, reeling at the knots, yeah. Conscious of a loss, yeah, but reaching for the ropes, grasping at the hope they give. conflict here, arriving, if you will, at a sort of act three of this therapy session. <laughs> so Rufus had been out in the world, he'd killed some people, he'd made friends with some people, but now he was returning to his creator, coming full circle, facing up to the past. And what had Dr. Perch been up to all this time, I hear you ask, and I'm in fact here asking now myself. Well, thank you. Of course, I had been utterly distraught this whole time. I searched for him frantically, and well, and I... she only bloody went and made another one, is what she did! Excuse me! You had time to tell your story, now I'm telling mine. You did, though, didn't you? You bloody well did! You went and made another one of me! Oh, Albert is nothing like you. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, fine. The voice, the voice is reedier, but beyond that, he looked identical. Actually, the voices sound just the same to me. When I'm listening to the recordings, I can't tell the characters apart. Oh, yeah. Do you said characters there? Beg your pardon? No, never mind. Okay, play the tape! <laughs> Good, Featherstone. His eyes are opening. He's alive. Turn off the machines. Nailed it. You're welcome. 
welcome. Ah, consciousness. Yes, thank you. How delightful. Uh, you must be my creator. Hello. Hello, Albert. Welcome to the world. What a refined creature you are. What a fine head of hair. Oh, well, I have you to thank for that, surely. <laughs> Yes, I suppose so. No, I, I don't wish to alarm you, but we, we seem to have a visitor over there in the shadow. Yes, that's right. I've been here the whole time, by which I mean the last few minutes. <laughs> I've watched you bring to life this grotesque doppelganger, this creature that must surely be my arch enemy. Ah, you must be my brother, Rufus. Hello. Oh, so that's it, is it? You, you just cast me aside and replace me. You're the one who walked out. And besides, this is my job. It's what I do. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. I, I, I bet you're employed by some evil corporation or something. Uh, uh, actually, I'm freelance now. I didn't quite see eye to eye with the Institute of Unethical Practices. Well, regardless, this is what I think of your new creation. What are you doing? Stay away from that. Oh, my good chair, for heaven's sake. Oh, my good curtain, stop that. And then I will... My good gasoline. Yes. Be careful with that, that's yes. flammable. <laughs> See how he likes some fire. Yeah, no, no, I don't like it. I'm, I'm being traumatized in my formative moments. Such displays of antagonism and domestic conflict in conjunction with the more immediate threat of fiery brand, the aggressive nature of incendiaries and fraught familial discord will forever be imprinted on my psyche. You're uh, scaring him. That's the idea. <laughs> uh, I'm having emotions that I don't know how to deal with. <laughs> what have you done? Not really sure. Uh, stride forward. I am yet frail and confused, but know that today you have created the nemesis that you hitherto only imagined you had. I will let you live for now, as I depart into the night, bringing chaos and destruction to the world. Uh, but should any harm come to our creator, I will track you down and destroy you horribly. <laughs> Declare this experiment a success. Right, so a lot to work with here. You see, it was all his fault. He's a terrible murderer who turned my masterpiece into the monster that is now terrorizing Karkov. What? I only did any of it because of you. You really haven't learned anything, have you? You don't know me! I created you, you monster! You monster! Ah! Oh! Ah! Get away from me! Bad ah! monster! Ah! No! No! Get your thumbs out of my eyes! No! Ah! No! Ah! Time for today. Oh no! What have I done? Oh well, we made some good progress, I think. Uh, we can arrange another session if you just talk to Ada on the way out. Uh, maybe just one on one this time. Don't worry, we'll take care of the body happens all the time. No! 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 Bye then! Uh, <laughs> end of session one. And so. A brutal monster destroys its own creator, closing a circle, or giving rise to a new beginning. The beginning of something brutal and terrible. And you too, dear listeners, must begin the terrible brutality of leaving us until the next unseen hour. <laughs> We hope that you were spun around by the Unseen Hour, episode 33, The Dull Sessions, number 330001, Reabnegator. The Unseen Hour is recorded live and monthly, usually on the first Wednesday of every month at the Rosemary Branch Theatre, courtesy of Unattended Items. This episode was performed originally by Bryce Stratford, Joey Timmons, and James Carney, and featured a monologue written by Jen Sugden and performed by Pip Gladwin. The musical guest was Bear Park. Theme music by The Unrecorded. The Unseen Hour is an Unseen Things production created, written, and produced by James Carney. This episode was recorded by Ella Watts and Odin Orn Halmarsen. And the podcast is produced creatively by Andy Goddard. We all look forward to seeing you here again at The Unseen Hour. <laughs> <laughs>